Um, I'm going to turn it over to the moderators of the expert roundtable. So we have Jeff Zeno, Vice President of the American Arbitration Association, and uh, Reka Rangchari, who is the Executive Director of the New York International Arbitration Center. Great. Professor, thank you so much. Um, yeah. You're an amazing moderator. You've, you, you, we're on schedule. I can't believe this. We're at 540. <laughs> With all the change ups that we did today, I, I can't believe it, but thank you. It's, it's been great. And these are hard acts to follow. Uh, you know, the governor was great. Deborah and Tom, you guys were terrific. So thank you. Um, but I first want to thank my co moderator, uh, Rekha Rangachari. Uh, she's a powerhouse in the diversity field. She's one of the co founders of the Racial Equality for Arbitration Law Law Lawyers. We're going to hear about that from Kabir. Uh, and we tonight have such an exceptional panel. It's, this is one of the best panels on diversity. I think we have nine leaders in the diversity field. Reka, you, you must agree, this is, a, this is a phenomenal panel. Agree? Okay. <laughs> okay, so we have, these are heavy hitters folks uh, tonight, and we're going to ask them a lot of questions. We're going to move kind of quickly through this, but we have a lot of interesting questions for them. These individuals, I think, uh, personally, and I know, Reka, you agree with me, they've moved the needle uh, in diversity, and uh, this is going to be a, a terrific program. I want to start off first by asking each of the in in individuals, there's nine of them, nine on our panel tonight, uh, to tell us briefly about themselves and about their organization and how their organization has created diversity in the space, I mean, how they've made a difference in diversity. So I'm gonna do an alphabetical order tonight. Um, and, and I usually don't like to do that because I'm Zeno, Z, I'm usually at the end, but I'm gonna do an alpha order. So Judge Shinlin, I'm sorry, you're last uh, on this, because uh, 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 SC, okay? But Jimmy, you're gonna go first. So Jimmy is with the Hispanic National Bar Association Region 2, so Jimmy, Tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how your organization uh, makes a difference in the diversity field. Sounds great. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Reka. Thanks, uh, thank you, everyone joining us. Um, a little bit about myself and HNBA. I am a plaintiff side attorney on class actions, um, on uh, consumer product class actions, and some other specialized uh, civil rights work. For that, as a prosecutor, and uh, this this issue is near and dear to my heart, just because I'm at a 100% woman-owned law firm. And the organization I'm here on behalf of, the Hispanic National Bar Association, um, it's really our, our core tenant is really uh, looking to diversify the legal field, but even looking inwards and, and looking at what comprises the Hispanic community and the uh, Latinx community and, and how can we fix diversity issues even within our own community. Um, because I think if anything has come up in the last couple of years, it's that um, labels are not enough and, and even demographic terms such as Hispanic and Latino uh, don't accurately portray all the picture and we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, later on. Um, regarding uh, improving diversity and inclusion in the arbitration and, and mediation space, um, HNBA has been um, a home for law students and attorneys to kind of round out their professional education. We have um, our corporate council conference every March. We have our national conference um, every spring, every uh, September, and uh, we regularly have CLEs and, and uh, networking opportunities for um, aspiring arbitrators to, to go and, and um, strengthen their network. At the same time, we also have a litigation and dispute resolution section. And one of the co-chairs is um, the Honorable uh, Judge uh, Adriel Belen, who's actually um, an arbitrator at JAMS. And so um, there's a healthy influx of um, arbitration mediation programming and, and mentorship opportunities there. Um, and Region 2, which was mentioned, is the New York region. So if any members here have uh, any interest in HNBA, you do not have to be Hispanic or Latinx to, to join. Um, if you work with uh, Hispanic uh, clients or, or work in that space in Latin America, we'd be more than happy to have a conversation, figure out how we can best uh, work together. Great. Thank you, uh, Jimmy. And uh, uh, Judge Valen is great. I, I love him. He's, he's a great arbitrator. Okay, so Kabir, I'm turning to you now. Uh, Kabir, uh, you're a co-founder with Reka of the Racial Equality for Arbitration Lawyers. Let's hear about that. Fantastic. You, let's hear about you too. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Kabir, Kabir Dagal. I'm based in New York, Arnold and Fotur. Uh, Reka is actually a few offices down from me. So hi, Reka. Uh, this is not just the Zoom boxes, just with the avoidance of any doubt. She's actually physically a few blocks away. Uh, so the organization a couple of us have co-founded is called as Real Racial Equality for Arbitration Lawyers. But many people actually present in the audiences are involved in some capacity or the other. I see Dana, Jeff, you yourself are involved with real. I'm an ambassador. Yes, I'm an yes, ambassador. Mansi, 
Nancy, I see them in the audience and all of them are associated with real. We were formally incorporated in New York last year and we are striving for the representation of underrepresented people groups in international arbitration. This will take three forms, right? One form, groups internationally that are not represented, Asians, Africans, Latin Americans, generally do not figure as prominent arbitrators. And we want to try and fix that. Second, representation of underrepresented groups within a country. The problem we see in countries like the United States that are very diverse, that diversity does not seem to be reflected in the senior ranks of the arbitral profession and definitely not at the arbitral ranks. And the third, the issue of intersectionality, which I think we hold as a very important area to focus on. Women of color, right? Fighting a gender battle and a race battle and they need very concerted and strategic thinking because of this dual or more than, you know, it could be a gay woman of color, in which case you're fighting three battles. So we're trying to think about intersectionality as well. I'm going to end very quickly. We have two goals, access and advocacy. Access, free to join. Anybody, you don't have to identify as a racial minority. We want to be inclusive for everybody. And advocacy, getting all key stakeholders to understand the importance of diversity. We'll talk more about this later, but let me stop here. Great. Thank you, Kabir. So now, Rachel, we're going to turn to you, and we're both colleagues uh, or board members of the ADR Inclusion Network. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and also about the ADR Inclusion Network? Sure. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks for having me here. Um, so I am a former commercial litigator and in-house counsel turned full-time neutral. I act as an independent mediator and arbitrator, um, and I have my own practice uh, based here in New York. Um, I'm actively involved in uh, various different organizations, but as Jeff just mentioned, I'm on the board of directors for the ADR Inclusion Network. Um, the ADR Inclusion Network is basically a group of individuals. Our board members are from various different organizations who are active in the ADR space. And our mission is to do exactly what we're talking about here tonight, increase the recruitment, selection, and retention of diverse neutrals. Um, what makes us a little different, and we're still in the foundational stages, but we're ultimately going to be a central repository of information and resources to help individuals who wanna start a career in ADR by posting information around trainings, um, scholarships, um, mentoring programs, and things of that nature, um, but also resources for practitioners to find diverse neutrals um, so any links to directories. Um, and also Jeff is spearheading this campaign, but we're putting together a speakers bureau so that when you're looking to put together a presentation relating to some topic relevant to ADR, whether it's training um, or discussing a certain industry, you're gonna have a speakers bureau to go to to find uh, speakers from diverse backgrounds who have that expertise. So that's what we're making us a little bit different. We're trying to be a go-to place because often people in trying to find neutrals or find information about how to become one, information is really scattered. So our goal is to really promote our mission by having everything in one place. Great. Thank you, Rachel. And now, Lauren, I'm going to turn to you. Uh, you're wearing uh, multiple hats because you're also a board member with us, uh, Rachel and myself, uh, on the uh, the, the uh, ADR Inclusion Network. So let's talk about the Metropolitan Black Bar Association and your yes. involvement and about you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, so my name is Lauren Jones. Uh, by way of background, I am a former litigation partner um, and now a mediator and mostly spend my days as ADR coordinator for New York City surrogates courts. Um, but today I'm here on behalf of the Metropolitan Black Bar Association, which I am the co-chair of the ADR section. Um, this section is only three years old, and together with my co-chair, Jill Program, um, we're very proud of the work that we've been able to do with the section. Um, through it, we have really developed an interest and participation in ADR amongst um, Black lawyers in the tri-state area. In 2020, we kicked off the section with a series of educational programs to introduce the MBBA members and diverse legal community at large to ADR. 
what it is, why they should consider it as a career, and dispelling myths surrounding it. We explained about the presumptive ADR program, which was then recently rolled out by the New York State Court Systems by the Chief Judge Steve Fiore, um, and held specific training events for people looking to hone their mediation skills and arbitration skills with well-known ADR professionals. After uh, having garnered interest in the field, we felt it was appropriate to take it to the next level, right? Speaking often about diversity or lack thereof in the ADR field, I was pretty adamant that we needed to offer a training to our members that was accessible, which meant it was at a low cost. Um, and we were able to partner with the New York State court system to create this partnership and this pathway. Um, there was a need. The New York court system needed to diversify their court rosters, and the MBBA really wanted to get some affordable training to their members. So we were able to select a class of 16, um, which was actually pretty competitive. We had about 50 people apply to be part of our inaugural mediation class. Um, we provided them with 24 hours of part 146 training, and they are currently undergoing advanced training in a topic of their selection. Um, recognizing, though, that training is only part of the battle, we are also excited that we're organizing a subsequent uh, educational series of seminars for this training class, which are going to include classes on marketing, oneself as a neutral, starting an ADR practice, and tapping into networks that you already have to get business and other topics that the class may be interested in delving into. Um, but that's, um, I could say more, but I will also conclude by saying that, you know, that's not enough, right? One big thing that will likely be a theme tonight, no doubt, is that training of mediators and giving them the tools to succeed is only half the battle. It's useless if no one selects them. So I'm excited that for Black History Month, um, the ADR section of the MBBA will present a panel comprised of the general counsel and VP of litigation for Duke Energy. And among the topics that we'll, we'll be discussing of significance will be the selection of diverse neutrals, what large corporations consider when selecting neutrals, and how we can ensure more diverse neutrals are given an opportunity to be considered and or selected. Um, so I hope you'll join us for that, which will be held on February 21st, and I will pass the mic to the next person. Thank Great. you. Great. Th thank you, Lauren. Uh, awesome. Uh, Anne, I'm going to turn to you now, Anne. Anne, Anne Lesser is my colleague at AAA ICDR. She's actually sitting in my, which used to be my office. She's downtown. Uh, I'm in Midtown right now. But Anne, tell us about the AAA ICDR Diversity Committee. You're the co-chair. You've been the co-chair for many years. And, and a, a little bit about yourself, too. And and how, sure. much you like, how much you like working with me. Oh, absolutely. Um, I am sitting in Jeff's uh, Jeff's old chair and Jeff's office, and I inherited his really big office, and he got a very small one I did. at uh, 150 East 42nd Street. So um, I, I wor it worked out better for me in the deal. But um, I just, so my name is Anne Lesser. I am a vice president at the AAA. I'm actually predominantly in the labor, employment, and elections area. But I'm also co-chair along with my colleague, Anjanil Gray, of our uh, Diversity and Inclusion Committee. I don't actually recall. It has been a number of years that we have uh, held this position. I, I don't I really remember how many. Um, of course, I'm sure you're all aware of AAA. We're one of the we are the largest provider of ADR services worldwide. So our uh, commitment to, to diversity really goes back to the 70s. Uh, we're not new to diversity. Uh, we've really been working uh, on diversity all the way back then. Um, but um, as a part of our shared commitment to diversity inclusion, we do actively recruit women and racially and ethnically diverse arbitrators. This has definitely been a multi-year effort through the organization. It's, it permeates the organization from our corporate goals through to our executive goals. We do review these numbers on a quarterly and annual basis to see where we are and to ensure that we're moving, moving the goalpost forward. Uh, in 2020, and I apologize that I don't have the 2021 numbers, but they're just getting finalized. But in 2020, 51% of our new panel members were women or racially and ethnically diverse individuals. Um, and this number is an increase over the, the past years. Um, we were asked to talk about some of our recent initiatives. So one of our newer initiatives was the creation of our AAA ICDR Council uh, Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Uh, this is a committee of legal and ADR professionals and actually Kabir is on this committee. Um, and this group has assisted us in providing insight into the marketplace and they work then this group works together with the Diversity and Inclusion Committee of AAA executives and staff uh, to coordinate initiatives and collaborate with firms and organizations. So we are known, I think many of you know about our Higginbotham Fellows Program, um, but another newer initiative which we undertook prior to COVID, which unfortunately 
due to COVID uh, wasn't repeated yet, but we plan to actually do it this fall. And uh, we hope that the COVID situation will be okay, but we don't care because we're gonna do it anyway. <laughs> we just can't, the world has to keep moving forward. Um, so that was our diverse student summit. So we decided um, to, to kind of look at the pipeline even earlier than the Higginbotham Fellows Program. Um, so this was a program where we introduced ADR to, uh, to students. It was a one and a half day ADR summit for diverse law students, which provided an in-depth understanding of what it really takes to become a successful arbitrator and mediator. Uh, the idea was that we wanted to reach out to students. So if this is what they wanted in their life, that they knew how to orient their career moving forward. And you know what? If they came to the one and a half day uh, summit and they said, wow, this isn't what I thought it was, we were fine with that outcome as well. We just wanted to really have them understand what this was all about. Um, the presenters included experienced ADR professionals and litigators from a variety of backgrounds, uh, demonstrating a successful career path as an arbitrator and mediator. The attendees learned the importance of focusing on a specific industry, on networking, connecting with mentors, gaining relevant experience and building a good reputation in the field. We actually had over 100 applications for 20 spaces. Um, and we had, they came from all over the United States and overseas. And um, we accepted, we had 20 we, spaces and we did provide students with a stipend to cover all their travel expenses. So we wanted to make this something that was very easy for them to do and that money would not be um, something that prohibited them from doing it. Um, another initiative that we uh, are doing as well is our diversity scholarship which is funded through the AAA ICDR Foundation. Um, this diversity scholarship fund grants diverse law students and professionals with up to $2,000 of financial assistance towards participation in a degree program or a fellowship in ADR or attendance at a well-recognized conference. And this really helps to encourage diversity and inclusion within the field of ADR by supporting the pursuit of knowledge and skill development, you know, through training experiences that are that are encouraging inclusive leadership and growth in the field of ADR. So these are new initiatives that we're involved in, um, which just you know complement the work that we've been doing for so so many years on 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 a, on uh, diversity and inclusion. Great, thank you, Anne, so much. Uh, now we're going to turn to Dana Dana McGrath, who is the president of Arbiter Women, also a council member member of the uh, AAA and a AAA arbitrator, AAA ICDR. So uh, Dana, tell us about Arbiter Women. You've been the president for a couple of years and uh, tell us about yourself too. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you to the organizers. Um, this is a fantastic program and I'm really happy to be a part of it. And to tell you a little bit about Arbiter Women, um, it has a almost 30 year history. So I will not be able to really download as much as I would like to in the short amount of time. So uh, please visit our website later if you're interested. So just some highlights at a high level. Um, Arbitral Women is an international nonprofit organization. It was um, launched and incorporated in Paris, France, close to 30 years ago. And it's dedicated to promoting women and diversity in arbitration and ADR or International Dispute Resolution. And um, we are looking forward to celebrating our 30th anniversary in 2023. We celebrated our 25th anniversary at the AAA ICDR home on 42nd Street with a full day diversity dividend conference. And that was a fantastic uh, celebration of diversity with many of the participants here today involved and the New York and international community supporting international um, diversity at, that has now been uh, spread to many other organizations. And that's one thing I'd like to say about Arbitral Women is that we love to partner with other organizations. So being a part of this program and learning more about all of the different programs that promote diversity is really interesting and inspiring to me because Arbitral Women wants to partner with each and every one of you and every organization um, an individual who wants to promote diversity. So what does Arbitral Women do? Um, I could talk for hours. I will keep it very short. 
<laughs> um, in uh, trying to boil it down to uh, some main things. So first is advocacy for gender parity and diversity. And we do that in many ways. Um, and I'll mention a few of them in a moment. Um, we also give diversity training, um, panel discussions, but also a more deep dive uh, training in the form of our Arbitral Women Diversity mm -hmm. Toolkit, which is a bespoke training program that was launched thanks to a generous grant from the AAA ICDR Foundation that made it possible to have a, an extended training program, which is very interactive, um, that you come away having addressed your unconscious and implicit biases and learned ways to overcome them. So that's something that um, is very important to us to try to empower people to understand uh, the challenges with respect to diversity and ways to address them. We also are very much committed to promoting the visibility of our women members and their qualifications. So when people ask where are the diverse lawyers, where's the talent, where's, where are women arbitrators, where are women lead counsel, um, come to us. We have our members directory available on our website. We also are happy to um, provide you know, informal uh, conversational guidance on where to find uh, diverse talent it's not only found at Arbitral Women, it's found at many of the organizations participating today on their websites and through their, their boards or their, their contact people can, can help steer you. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of sources to find the diverse talent. And part of what I think we're doing here today, or one of our goals is to, to share that information and make it more accessible. Um, finally, the last thing I'll highlight is that we, try to empower the next generation of diverse women and diverse lawyers generally. And I think one key way you do that is by giving visibility to the younger talent. And you can do that in a number of different ways. We have media platforms on which we, we try to profile and feature um, diverse talent um, of all ages, um, young and and senior practitioners as well um, in our newsletters, in our news alerts, and on a page that's actually dedicated to news about our members. So anytime a member has an achievement, um, we'd like to feature that. Um, but we also do things like funding of moot court teams that would otherwise be unable to participate in a moot competition because of um, financial resources. Um, we have a relationship with the Clure Arbitration blog, so that is a publications opportunity for our members. Um, if they would like to have the opportunity to publish in the blog um, through being a member of Arbitral Women, we can facilitate that, um, give opportunities for visibility for uh, publications. Um, we also emphasize networking, and I think everyone here is well aware of the value of networking, but how do you break into that network? that's not so easy. And um, we'll talk later a little bit about how the pivot to virtual has made that um, easier for some who were more distanced and unable to network in person as easily. But in short, we have um, in-person networking events um, that are either pure networking events or are substantive programs and conferences that showcase women who have expertise and subject matter knowledge in areas of various you know, dispute resolution, um, hot topics like you know, energy and you know, all, all the topics that you might not readily think women have expertise in, tech, IP, energy, um, mining, um, quantum experts, people who testify in arbitrations on quantum issues or other expert issues. Um, there are so many women who are talented and capable to, of testifying in arbitration. We have programs that feature these women and share their talent and followed up with networking. Um, finally, I will end with a plug for our Young Arbitral Women Practitioners Program. That is an important program by which we try to include the up and coming generation, the next generation of arbitration in ADR leaders 
and it is a group within Arbitral Women. So it sort of is its own group, but it's within Arbitral Women. And we just ushered in a brand new steering committee, the 2022 steering committee that is just um, super excited to launch a number of new programs. So I'm not, I'm not gonna steal their limelight. You'll be, stay tuned. You'll be hearing from them soon. But that is a dynamic growing area of Arbitral Women. And we're an organization that's now close to 30 years old. I think it's really important that we share with the next generation the knowledge that we've gained and what we've learned about how to advocate for women and diversity, that we partner with other organizations and we empower the next generation to carry the torch going forward. Thank you. Great, Great. thank you, Dana. Thank you so much. Uh, now we're gonna turn, Rodney, we're gonna turn to you. Rodney, uh, I think you've, you've held your annual meetings here at my office, uh, pre-pandemic uh, and we miss That's you guys. Right. Uh, yeah, Absolutely. I think two years in a row. We do miss you. But, two years in a row. Yes, you remember. Yes, Thank yes. You so and, uh, much, Jeff. Thank hope, you. Hope, hopefully again soon. But uh, tell us I a little bit. I know. We yourself. miss it. Yes. And uh, about the Haitian American Lawyers Association in New York. Tell us about that. Absolutely. Please. Absolutely. So um, I'm Ronnie Pepe Souvenir. I am the former past president and a board member of the Haitian American Lawyers Association. And it is a, law, a, a, a legal organization made up mostly of Haitian American lawyers many of us first generationers, which I think is part of diversity in a sense, when you think about diverse um, organizations. And our goal is to um, empower, uh, to expose our members um, to the, the legal professions and what they can do in their community as attorneys. Um, and to also show uh, the ability of a different thought process and a different group in the legal profession. Um, our exposure, of course, to the AAA was through our having our organizations have their um, installations at the AAA, which was great because it gave an exposure to many of our attorneys, other aspects of the legal profession, not just litigation, but the opportunity to do something different. And they were very impressed with it. Um, some of our members did apply to the Lee and Higabotham program that you have and reached out to some of the people that they met here, which was great. Um, we basically are not an old organization. We started 10 years ago, but every day we work towards um, trying to expose our members uh, to other things. I can say by way of my background, um, I went to Cardozo Law School and did their mediation program there and was trained under Layla Love, who's very well known in the mediation ADR community and you know did victim services mediations. And even now as a uh, an attorney um, working for CUNY doing Title IX and sexual harassment and sexual misconduct uh, um, uh, cases, I use a lot of mediation and ADR um, in discussing and in talking to our students and that sort of thing. So um, I am exposed to diversity and ADR and using all that thing and try to expose it to our members. Great, thank you so much, Rodney. Okay, Joanne, I'm turning to you now. Uh, Joanne uh, 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 used to work with me down the hallway. And I, actually the last program I did in my office, uh, Joanne was right down the hallway from me. I, I miss uh, having you here. Uh, we did a diversity program a few months ago. But Joanne uh, works for uh, GMS, and she's the diversity director, a new position. Tell us about that and tell us about what GMS is doing. Definitely. Uh, my name is Joanne St. Louis and I am the diversity program manager here at JAMS. Um, I'm going to keep it high level just for the interest of time. Um, so JAMS is the largest private uh, ADR um, institution. Uh, JAMS, JAMS is steadfast in pursuing um, increasing diversity among ADR professionals. Um, we recognize the benefits of recruiting and retaining um, ADR professionals, uh, inclusive of ethnicity, race, gender, religion, sexual orientation, as well as age. Um, to tell you a little bit about uh, our organization, we have always embraced and encouraged diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and one of the big highlights that JAMS did two and a half years ago, which was hiring me. Um, I'm one of the first, uh, probably I still think the only, uh, ADR professional um, that's a full-time uh, diversity, equity, inclusion manager that uh, is uh, hired to really um, 
put together uh, initiatives as well as pushing them forward um, and making them come to fruition. Um, here at JAMS also, we have a cross-functional diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. Um, and our chair is Mark Smalls, our CMO, and it's fabulous getting to work with him. Alongside, um, we work closely with our diversity, equity, inclusion um, panelist advisory board as well. So we always make to look, always make sure to look that we have um, not just an associate side, but as well as a neutral perspective when we're looking to create um, and uh, implement diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. Here at JAMS, our structure is different than um, most ADR um, institutions, and this allows us the opportunity to really market and put lots of backing behind our diverse neutrals. And I think that that's what makes us uh, a unique outfit in the ADR community. Um, this allows us to not only recruit and ret uh, recruit diverse neutrals, but also work on the, re the retention, which is even more important, right? As we always say, the field of dreams, if we build it, they will come, but we need to make sure that we're getting them work in order for them to stay and sustain themselves within the industry. And we are able to do so um, by, create, by the marketing opportunities, wh whether it's looking for writing opportunities for them, speaking opportunities, video marketing, as well as social media. Um, and this allows them to really get a greater publication footprint to make sure that they're prevalent and well known within um, the industry. I will also say another uh, great highlight that I would love to highlight on this call today is our diversity and inclusion clause. Um, we are the first provider to create this. And, and this is really important in the sense that um, the verbiage of this clause states that parties will consider utilizing a diverse neutral um, when they have an, ar uh, an arbitration slate in front of them. And this is important because it makes it a qualifying proponent when not just an institution is putting their lists together, but as well as for the decision makers that are deciding um, to make sure that they're considering diverse neutrals. Uh, and I will say also, um, we also recently created a diversity fellowship, and I'm proud to say uh, our, our inaugural class started actually in New York, and two of our um, fellows are actually here on this call today, Rachel Gupta and Genesis Fisher. Um, we're looking forward to continuing our fellowship and um, having an initial class again the fall of 2022. So if you're interested, love to speak to you and, and get you some information on our fellowship. Um, last but certainly not least, uh, you know, we also partner with many affinity bar associations as well as organizations. Um, this is very important to our work um, in order to create programming, whether it's to plant the seed and make sure that we're filtering the pipeline and diversity in ADR, um, but as well as having the programs that talk about the importance of the selection process, right? Um, here as there's only so much that institutions can do, the outreach needs to continue to to ensure that we're educating in-house as well as outside counsel the importance of the selection process. Um, I you know, encourage you to visit our JAMS diversity page. There's many more initiatives um, that we are working on and will continue to work on. Great. Thank you, Joanne. And I wish you were here. I could see you tonight, but I, soon uh, you're in Atlanta. Dude, Judge Shinlin, yeah, Judge Shinlin, I'm sorry. You're, you're the alphabetically, you're the last one like me with a Z. I'm always last. Uh, but uh, you, I, I want you to tell me about you're the co-chair of the, the diversity task force for CPR. You've done a lot of work with that. I know for many years. So can you tell us about that, Judge Shinlin? Yes. And, and you also said we should tell you a little bit about ourselves. I think most people know. I spent a total of 27 years on the federal bench in both the Eastern and Southern districts of New York. Uh, since I left, I've been doing arbitration and mediation. I'm proud to say I'm on the list of the AAA ICDR, also CPR, which you're gonna hear about in a minute, also FedR. So I'm very pleased to be the co-chair of the Diversity Task Force of the International Institute for Conflict Prevention and Resolution, which is CPR. Now. The fastest speaker was Lauren Jones. She won a prize. I can't <laughs> compete. I can't compete with her for speed, but I'm going to do my best to cover my topic a little bit slower than Lauren did. She was fabulous. Okay, so CPR is an energizer bunny in this field, in my opinion. They have a number of initiatives. The only problem is, as the last speaker, some of those initiatives will sound similar to what other people are doing. Still, in all, in fairness to CPR, let me run through them. One is what they call growing the pipeline. And that's really important. They are collaborating with bar associations to expand CPR's universe of neutrals, reaching out to the affinity bar associations and 
inviting them to get involved in this field. So that's really great. They also, like other groups, have diversity scholarships for CPR's annual meeting where there's so much learning to be had. Uh, then they support this pipeline. They help people uh, with mentoring and apprentice programs uh, through CPR, also at FINRA. They have a young lawyer rule, which I don't know if you all know about that, but that's to encourage the junior attorneys to actually speak up at arbitrations and mediations. And I know all about that because I started a similar rule in the court system, which caught on like wildfire across the country. Um, they promote uh, diverse people. They've created a brochure promoting, for example, distinguished female neutrals, of which they have many. Um, and they also give a diversity award in ADR. And I know some of you have uh, either won that award or going to be winning that award any year soon. Okay, uh, now they've also committed to improving selection and that's the toughest areas you're gonna hear about. They have some really uh, good statistics too. I heard somebody mention statistics. 40% of the roster now of distinguished neutrals there are from diverse backgrounds. That is a great statistic. 50% of newly admitted panelists are from diverse backgrounds. That's truly impressive. 100% of the slates created by CPR have a minimum of 30% diverse neutrals. They're committed to that. That's called the Ray Corollary. I won't tell you why, but they're committed to 30%. And over 40% of neutral selections have been from people with diverse backgrounds. Now, that's in 21 and 22. And that is 2021 and 2022. So I'm not going to tell you about the many years before that. But that's where we are today. And that's what's important is to talk about our progress. So in addition to that, there are a couple other initiatives I just want to mention quickly. Uh, CPR has a diversity, equity, and inclusion statement, which goes out in every nomination letter and encourages everyone to consider diversity when making selections. It also has, and you just heard about that from Joanne, it has a model clause. She said hers was first, maybe so. I thought ours was first. It doesn't matter. I'm glad we both have it. But we have a diversity commitment clause where in their contracts, in their contracts, we ask that people consider putting in the arbitration clause of the contract before there's even a dispute, a commitment that when and if there's a dispute and a tribunal, at least one member of that tribunal will be a person from a diverse background. And we understand that people are putting this clause in their contract. So we're really uh, quite thrilled about that. We have something called the National Task Force on Diversity Commitment, where we ask the corporate community to be aware of this issue and be committed to it. We ask the law firm community to be committed to it and aware of it. You heard Mr. Maroney speak about that, that's great. And of course, as an institution, CPR is committed to that also. So there's our commitment. And I think I've covered everything, hopefully within, not the one minute, but the yeah. two minutes. <laughs> no, no, all, you know, all of you are great. Thank you. And it's, it's time to rock. All of you exceeded the one minute rule, but that's fine. It's, it's great hearing about your organizations. It really is. So Reka, we have to rock now. We have, a, you know, a, we have eight questions we want to ask you guys. We want to move quickly. So Reka, I'll turn it over to you to uh, ask the questions, uh, some of the questions to the group. Okay, well, thanks so much, uh, Jeff and Peter, to all of our phenomenal speakers. The goal here was to allow each of our illustrious leaders in the diversity space to set a standard. So we enter level playing field, so to speak, as well, please research these groups and these people who have spoken, they're available to you. With that though, as the governor reminded us, we cannot take the lack of diversity for granted. So in this session, we're going to assess the state of play we want you to be thoughtful as well as critical where we are and where we need to head to move in the only operable direction forward. And so with that, Kabir, first question goes to you. What is not working and why? Where have we failed? Have we just been discussing diversity issues but not truly making a significant difference? Thank you, Reka. That's a tough one <laughs> because I'd like to believe all of us are at least in some small way trying to make a difference, right? Uh, we wouldn't do it otherwise. But we are talking about deep-rooted societal issues. And even though we don't acknowledge this as much as we should, we are a part of society 
and all the problems that exist in society are going to exist in our profession. So I just want to acknowledge that these are very deep-rooted problems. To answer your question, let me offer three thoughts and I'll try to do this quickly. I know you gave me five minutes. Taking the cue from Judge Shendlin, I'll try to be faster. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, we, we're giving you less than five minutes because we want to hear from the other group members too. But <laughs> <laughs> see, <laughs> it's already even reduced. <laughs> okay, let me let me make three very quick points. There can be in the ADR field a tension between the goal for diversity versus the goal for winning, and the goal for winning is going to take you to the status quo. And you don't need to convince me of the merits of having a diverse tribunal, which will produce better results. But that may not be a goal that the party wants. The party may want to win the case. And to win the case, a known devil is better than an unknown angel. You will go to people you know, and going to people you know often are not diverse. So there is this tension that I think we need to acknowledge. This is a fundamental principle of arbitration. Select your, your decision maker and there's some tension there. Second, again, I'm going to steal something Judge Shindlin mentioned. It is important for us in the diversity dialogue to make sure that our dialogue is not just to us. I'm not a woman. But I can, as a diverse lawyer, I can understand the gender struggle. Non-diverse lawyers may not appreciate that. And it is important to include them. It is important to include constituents who may not necessarily appreciate the issues that diverse lawyers may. Until we don't get them in, we may not be moving the diversity needle the way we should. So just thinking broad, thinking more inclusively and thinking of not the constituents of diversity, but everyone may be necessary. Final point, all these diversity initiatives have an angle and that is awesome. We need to be focused on specific issues, but it is important for all of us to work together this is happening. I, I, I don't mean this as a criticism, but we're still not at the stage, right? We see this in Hollywood, right? You can't have two lawyers, uh, you can't have two actors of color because then your show or your movie is a movie for colored people, right? We have heard that. It's the same. We're just not there as a society where you can have more than one diverse arbitrator on a panel, right? This is a problem. We all need to work together to make sure that that is something we take for granted. All women, all lawyers of color and different permutations and combinations, right? You're gonna have a gay lawyer sitting with a Latinx lawyer sitting with an African-American woman. That should be normal. And all our groups therefore need to work together because we are all fighting for the same goal for greater representation. So with that, I'm going to stop here. And I want to hear what others have to say. Jeff, can I add something here? Absolutely, please. Uh, okay, so I think we need to talk about the long view. The question is posed, where have we failed? I think we have to talk about where we've succeeded. Meaning, meaning look where we are today compared to where we were. Progress has been slow, admittedly. It's taken us a long time to get here. But in the introductions, you heard many, many of us say, paddles are 40%, paddles are 50%. Uh, and the, and the, the selection is getting better and people are committing to one out of three minimally. So it's, it's, it's happening, folks. I know it took a while, but I want to be optimistic and say all that you heard in those introductions should give you great optimism that we are making a difference. Great point. Really great point. Any, any, uh, any other comments from the other panelists? 
Can I make one? So yep. I agree Please. with Judge and Lynn there about we need to recognize that having the conversation is positive. We're, we're speaking about this much more. There are so many initiatives and the statistics are showing that we're moving in the right direction. But in something that, I, I just to be a contrarian, something that still isn't working in the ADR field, in the legal industry in itself, we're already underrepresented. Um, and partly we know that we're making strides there. But part of what is compounded in the ADR field is that when you're entering in, uh, as a neutral, there aren't a lot of paid opportunities. Nine out of 10 neutrals will tell you, don't quit your day job, start building it slowly over time. You have to do it part-time. We, in a, as, a, as a consequence of that, we are immediately limiting the field to um, narrowing those who it's actually feasible for them to get into this field. Um, so that's why you see a lot of people entering this when they're later in their career, when they're kind of maybe transitioning between law firm life and retirement, this is something in between. It's not necessarily encouraging a lot of younger folks to get into this field because there aren't a lot of opportunities right off the bat for paid opportunities. And I think that's where we need I to agree. change because that is already kind of narrowing it too far. A great point, really great point. Any other comments for our panelists before we go to the next question? Any other comments? Okay. I would just give a shout out to the Rising Arbitrators Initiative that is focused on precisely that, Rachel, giving visibility and empowering the next generation of independent arbitrators and mediators who are doing that 100% as a career opportunity. And, and, and so um, RAI, or Rising Arbitrators Initiative, um, keep it in mind. Great. Okay, our next question goes to Joanne and Lauren. Uh, what resources and tools are out there to learn about diverse arbitrators? I know there are some resources and they're growing now. So Joanne, Lauren, Joanne, you, you can kick it off. Definitely, thank you, um, Jeff. So there are many initiatives and one of them I will start with is, is one of the JAMS initiatives is that um, we recently um, did a full um, identification of all of our, of our panels and where they were able to self-identify. And now we have that list that is available, available upon request, should you request a list of all of our diverse neutrals that have self-identified. Um, now, as I know um, earlier, we talked about the arbitrators of African descent and uh, Nancy Thevesen, as well as Catherine Simpson, um, had worked tirelessly to put this list together. And that um, list talks about it as well as for international, but there are some neutrals um, of African descent that are also domestic um, neutrals as well. So definitely take a look at that. It's easily Googleable for you to be able to find that PDF and it's consistently being updated, um, which is always great. So if you are a neutral of African descent and you'd like to be placed on that list, I implore you to contact Catherine S Simpson and, and Nancy Thevesen to get yourself on that list. Um, as well as NAPABA, which is the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association. Um, they are currently putting together a list of neutrals um, that are part of their bar association to be available upon request, as well as the Hispanic National Bar Association, um, which is great. And I implore many bar associations to continue to do that work as well um, and get that information out to your members to let them know that this profession is available to them. And if they are within this practice to make sure that they're being recognized within the community. Um, the other initiative that actually I'm going to be working on as well as through the uh, ABA Diverse, um, Diversity Committee, which is through the dispute resolution section, um, we are going to be putting together a list of um, uh, minority uh, dispute resolution um, professionals uh, known as MITRE, which will be able to put together a list of neutrals that are of ethnic descent, as well as women, um, focusing as well as sexual orientation, um, and as, as well as disability. So looking forward to getting um, an ABA uh, roster together of um, available neutrals as well. Uh, as well as, so I can say, um, for tracking certain yep. things that I think that what we can do um, here at JAMS, we recently started a neutral utilization report for um, in-house uh, counsel as well as for attorneys to be able to track their utilization. Um, it's one thing to put all the onus on the institutions because we can provide diverse slates uh, till we're blue in the face, but we need to make sure that the selection process is happening. And through this neutral utilization report, it puts some of the onus on um, the, the, um, the selection um, individuals that that way that they can actually look to see are they moving the needle and have some stake in the game um, to be able to help us move um, the needle in the sense of the selection process. 
Great. Thank you, Joanne. Lauren, I know we, we have the, the Speakers Bureau at the ADR Inclusion Network. Uh, anything else to add on that? Absolutely. Um, and, and before I talk about the ADR network, which, which has a very big role, I think, in this, um, there are a few other resources that I'd like to make known. Um, first of all, the dispute resolution section of the City Bar, as well as the State Bar, New York State Bar, has worked really hard to put together a comprehensive list of diverse, uh, they're calling it the diversity, equity, and inclusion list. Now, there are 17 other bar associations, um, MBBA being one of them, that supported this endeavor. And that list um, is available both on the City Bar website, as well as the State Bar website. Ultimately, hopefully, it will be made available by all the 17 supporting bar associations. And that list is comprised of, it's searchable um, by practice location, name, um, self-identifying identifying qualities such as race and, um, and gender and things like that. So that's, that's another resource. And also there is the National Bar Association, the ADR section. Um, I am the social media chair of that, another hat I wear. Um, and I'm really proud of that list. It was, it was put together before I, I got on, so I can't take credit for that. Um, a lot of hard work went into vetting that list um, and making sure that the mem people on both the arbitrator and the mediation list were vetted. And it's exciting now because now that list is searchable also by name, geography, and um, practice area. So two other really great resources. And finally, also through the ABA, there's wider um, women in dispute resolution. Yeah which is great. Um, now, you know, these these lists are all a, certainly a step in the right direction, right? First and foremost, they dispel the myth that there is a lack of qualified diverse neutrals or mediators, right? And it removes any excuse that while they may exist, people don't know who they are or where to find them. So here you are, a half a dozen lists that each contain over, you know, dozens of names. Um, so that's all great. Um, one thing that Rachel spoke upon, which I think is is really where the ADR um, inclusion network comes into play, is right is that they're all kind of scattered. They're they're a bit everywhere, and some people may feel very overwhelmed if you're coming to this for the first time and you say, "Oh, right, I hear this. I attended this great you know symposium. I want to make a difference. Where do I start?" Um, and you could look any number of places. And what we're looking to do also, which is is really great, is to create streamline this process to create one repository where everyone can actually go and find maybe there's six lists, but I can look in one spot to find them. And similar with speakers, you know, Jeff, you were just alluding to that. If you want to have a diverse speaker, a lot of people have commitments to have diverse speakers on their panels, and they don't know where to look either. Um, the Inclusion Network intends on putting together a database, which I think will really be very helpful in putting these mediators before the right audience, so they can then demonstrate their expertise, they can then demonstrate what they know and become someone that can be relied upon and then ultimately select it. Jeff, I just want to add one more thing on that um, as part of the question, um, just to put out there as well. You know, all of our um, institutions as well as organizations have many pledges and um, initiatives that are out there um, to ensure that diverse slates are being out there uh, or resources, as we said, of where you can find diverse neutrals. Um, we have to go beyond that at this point. And there needs to be a way, whether it's reporting um, or you know, um, being able to put information out there on your selection or how you're doing, um, just to push that need a little bit for, forward to make sure that we're putting their foot to the fire. Um, because the selection is really where we need to put a lot of our resources at this point. Absolutely. Hey, 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 hey Jeff. Yes. Um, Tom. Yeah. Tom, yeah. Uh, Tom, Tom Maroney here. Uh, I'd just like to pick up on the great point that Joanne and Lauren both made. And that's, this is a tremendous panel yes. that is all focused on the same goal. And I would like to invite each and every one of the members of your panel, Jeff, yep. to send me an email because we need this data. Yes. We can take this data, we can, DRI has devoted substantial resources to developing this database, and we can assist in this great, great effort by everyone on this panel. So I, I, my, my email is in the chat. I invite each and every one of you to send me an email, and let's get this data in one central Focus database. So a great point by both Joanne and Lauren, as well as the president-elect of the ABA. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Tom. Rake, I'll turn it over to you for the next yeah, question. Jeff, I just 
just oh, had yeah. one of the comments. Oh, Anne, yeah, Anne, Anne, yeah, add in, please. No, so I mean, I really think that Joanne made a good point, and I agree with Joanne uh, in terms of looking at the selections data. Uh, you know, AAA also looks at that. We look, we we track appointments, and we see we're tracking the listing versus the appointments and where they land. Um, and actually, we're finding that it's a pretty much at an even uh, amount. But I think that's important also from the from the perspective of the neutrals on all these lists, because you want people to say, not only am I okay, I got onto Jam's panel, I got onto AAA's panel, CPR's panel, but it's important for people to see for those diverse. Uh, neutrals to see that they can get selected, that they will be selected. Um, so I think maintaining and the transparency of those statistics are very important. Excellent. Good. Great point. Great point. Reka, I'll, I'll turn it over to you for the next question. So we wanted to address also the impact of pandemic. Pivot is a word that's often used during these times. And so to Dana, how has the pivot to the virtual environment impacted diversity efforts for good, for bad, status quo? What's your view? Thank you, Reka. Um, I have a positive view of the pivot to virtual. And I know that that is not universal. So I'm gonna throw out some positives and I'm happy to hear uh, some of the, um, the other views. So one thing that I think is really helpful and should continue after the pandemic ends with the pivot to virtual is that it has made more accessible programs and training on virtual platforms that would be not accessible to those who face socioeconomic barriers. And there are so many who cannot afford to fly across the world and pay for hotels and, and to attend conferences and networking events. The premium you had to pay to enter the world of international arbitration or ADR or mediation, it was a very, very high premium just even to walk into the room and virtual has changed that. Um, you deal with time changes, time zone changes and some other obstacles. Technology is not consistently, you know, at the top level around the world. I understand not everybody can access um, through virtual, but many, many more can than ever could before. And it's really, I think, changing the landscape for empowering the next generation and empowering all of us to see the other players in this field. So that's my big positive push for let's continue some form of virtual after the pandemic. Um, it also has uh, assisted greatly, I think, women who are in a, a very difficult compromised position of juggling family responsibilities and trying to forge a career in international arbitration and ADR. You know, they can't necessarily just up and leave their family for a week to go to a conference when they have, um, you know, family responsibilities that require them to be physically home. Um, virtual has um, in part liberated them from being excluded from that. So I really am a big fan of the pivot to virtual for those reasons. Um, and just a third thing, and I'll turn it over to others, um, in virtual, there have been a number of initiative launched by women. Um, I focus on women because I'm president of Arbitral Women. I, I don't mean that at the exclusion of all the other diversity initiatives out there of which I'm also involved, but I'll just, by way of example, um, the Mute Off Thursdays initiative was launched by four women. It's a weekly 30 minute educational session and networking session in which every Thursday at the same time, women, 200, 300 women get together for one half hour, for 15 minutes, someone presents on something substantive, demonstrating a woman has niche substantive expertise in an area that nobody knew they had. And the next 15 minutes, she fields questions and there's a dialogue and networking. That 30 minutes is something that many people carve out of their week and look forward to. That Thursday is, that's a special time for women. Women who were isolated and alone during pandemic came together through this initiative launched by women for women. That's the kind of thing that really didn't happen five years ago. 
And there are other initiatives like it. And so for I won't list them all, time's short, but I really think that the virtual has opened so many doors, so many positive opportunities for people. So we'll hear about the downsides maybe, or maybe we'll talk about that on another panel, but I am a big fan of keeping some aspect of virtual going post pandemic. Thank you. Um I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, my co, uh, co-conductor role, I'm gonna give the code word, which you may be looking for. <laughs> code word three is support. Code word three for CLE is support. Very mindful of time. Um, the floor is Jeff to pose the next question. Sure, sure. I mean, I would love speakers to please, we're gonna try to get through all these topics so we spotlight everyone. Jeff. Okay, now, now, yeah, now we're turning to the uh, the hard questions, okay? And the interesting questions. Uh, Anne, I'm gonna go to you, my my uh, colleague, okay? So Anne, this, I'm turning to you. Is there a race and gender divide with some in our ADR community with respect to some of our initiatives? Is there a race and gender divide? Do you see that? So. You know, I don't know. I've really sort of tried to give it a lot of thought, um, having gotten this question assigned to me. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I would specifically say that there was a race and gender divide, but I can tell you what I've observed. And I think what I've observed more recently uh, in terms of programming and in terms of the conversation, I think this, the conversation is shifting more uh, to racially, ethnically and racially diverse individuals and away from women as a whole and white women. Um, and I, because I think people feel that for a lot of time, there was a lot of emphasis on women. Um, and so I think there's been a shift in, in that conversation. But I, at the same time, I think we also need to keep in mind that women include ethnically and racially diverse women. And I think somebody earlier in the program uh, illustrated that point in that it's a very difficult if you are an ethnically and racially diverse person and you're also a woman, you're facing even more barriers. So I think we have to keep that you know, in mind as well. And I also think it's important to still continue to focus on women um, because if you look at statistics, and I've seen statistics that were put out over several years from the ABA, I mean, and what's been mentioned uh, many, many times today, that women as a whole are still underrepresented in the legal field and on the bench. Um, so I, I think we're going to have to continue to advocate for diversity with res both, both with respect to gender and to race, and that we have to keep both of those in mind as we move you know, forward on this. Absolutely. Uh, does anyone else have a comment on that? Any other panelists have a comment on that? Interesting topic. Okay. All right, Reka, I'll move to you for the next question then. Okay. Um, next question goes to Rachel. Appreciating diversity depends on the situation and labels only go so far as Deborah and Jimmy remind us, are we properly defining diversity in our ADR community? So I, I, you already kind of stole the thunder because I think Deborah did say it right, that it is really dependent on the context. Um, but I do think in the organizations that I've been involved in, there really is a focus on trying to keep it a broad definition in theory. And so in the way certain initiatives are defined, it is to be broad enough to include um, gender, race, um, sexual identity, gender identity, disability, and then um, you know, members of historically underrepresented communities. And that's where the context comes into play because those members of historically underrepresented communities really will depend on really what you're thinking about. Um, you know, a good focus though to think about in practice, I think there is, as Anne just said, there has been a focus either on gender or race and a kind of emphasis, I think, um, recently with some organizations with um, kind of a furthering mission towards people of color because um, they have been historically, you know, most underrepresented and there's really a focus on that. Um, in practice, I have not seen a lot of initiatives focusing on other segments such as um, disability. And I think that those are efforts that should be made and could be made further. Um, you know, Lauren mentioned the um, 
the DEI uh, directory that was recently launched by the New York City Bar and New York State Bar along with 17 partner organizations. And what that did was it really included each of those categories of self-identifying characteristics. So people who identified as women, people who identified as having a disability, as LGBTQ, et cetera. And what it did is the, when you filled out the questionnaire to be part of that directory, there were no boxes that you had to check. They were more open-ended um, in terms of defining your background, in terms of your cultural background. We didn't put um, you know, what had been historically you know, white or African-American or Latino-American. We kept it open so that people can define and describe themselves as they were comfortable. And I thought that that was really unique um, because when you finally got the, the final directory, it's very interesting to take a look at and see how people identify themselves. And I think that's where the focus is, is letting people identify themselves as they're comfortable as opposed to fitting them into a box. And any other comments before we move to the next question? Well, I think Kabir has a comment. Kabir? <laughs> I just want to make one. I, just, I can see that you had a comment ready. I can yeah, see. you could. That's awesome. <laughs> I just want to make one point here that when we're talking about international arbitration, it should be international. It is important for us to acknowledge that it is not. And that even in Asia, even in Africa, the arbitrators are not Asians or Africans. The power is still largely white. I just, we have to accept this reality. Now this could come from Asians, Africans, from Latin Americans. It could be, you know, colonization of the mind is still a reality, but the power structures are still with Caucasians. And I just want to, I want to put that on the table. This is something that I think we should acknowledge and do something about. Thank you. If I can jump in here, uh, Jeff and Reka, real yeah, quickly. Um, yeah, I think that that's uh, a strong point that needs to be, uh, it can't be repeated enough in, in these kind of, kind of conversations. We look at diversity and we tend to think, especially in the international context, well, if it's not US-based, then it must be diverse, right? But um, as Kabir is rightly putting it, White supremacy didn't start in the United States. Uh, it was brought over here from somewhere else. And same when we were, you're looking at Latino America, um, Latinidad and the concept of what a Hispanic community is or, or what, what, who and what is a Latino or Latina or Latinx, um, this wasn't created, uh, it, it's not indigenous, it's not local. It was created by it, through a system of uh, black people, white people, indigenous people were uh, mixed by force. Um, let's call it for what it is, let's be direct as, as um, Governor Patterson mentioned, let's be direct and, and clear about this. It was by force. And um, the, the white supremacy and the racial hierarchy was perpetuated there, at least in Latin America, with the clear skin. And it's no coincidence statistically that the regional president of even an affinity bar association like the HNBA, myself, is a white male. Um, there's a lot of, lot of uh, uh, privilege in that and that comes from it. And so when we're looking at these labels and, and what kind of um, definitions we give to diversity conversations, um, it's very easy to just leave it at the easy uh, category of, well, is this person Hispanic or Latinx? Not really thinking critically, like, well, are, out of all these 10 Hispanic attorneys, how many of them could pass off as white or Asian? And where are the darker skinned uh, individuals? And why is something like Afro-Latinidad such a weird concept? And for all of us, if we look at our own law schools, look at the Black Law Student Association, look at the Latino Law Student Association, and we should ask ourselves, where are we putting our Caribbean siblings? Where are we putting our uh, dark-skinned Mexican siblings, our dark-skinned Peruvian siblings? There's a huge history of white supremacy and racism in, in Latin America, and it just can't get discounted. And that's something that we could have our own CLE about that, but just really yes. want to quickly point out on that uh, definitional um, issue. Jeremy, that's a, that's a great point, that's a really great point. Anyone else have a comment on uh, this yes, last question? I, I do, and I, and I don't want to belabor the point. You know, this is very interesting because this is where the uncomfortable conversation yes. comes in, you know. Um, so I really appreciate Rachel's description on how people choose to identify themselves. And that's a really big point as well, because you may have someone who by color is what you call a colored person or, or whatever, and they describe themselves very different and don't even go to the color. 
They may describe themselves as a graduate specializing and blah, 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 and whatever. It may not even go to the color. So there's also an identity issue as well when we come to talking about diversity and the groups of people that we're dealing with. And I think it's very important. And I, and I really appreciate the conversation that Kabir and James put forth because there is that, that, that kind of tension that you're dealing with, you know, with the idea of the, the white supremacy and then how do you identify the different groups and where they fit in. Great, great point. Thank you, Rodney. So Jimmy, I'm gonna to turn to you now. You have an interesting question here. Okay, um, are some, for example, white male arbitrators being excluded from our initiatives, our diversity initiatives? What, what, what are your thought, thoughts on that? Yeah, th thanks for the question. Um, I'll start with a caveat that uh, white males is usually the, the term, the, the foil in these kind of conversations, right? Yep. But even uh, as was mentioned before, diversity can be invisible and a white male could also have uh, be diverse in other ways, uh, disabilities or their sexual orientation. But assuming, you know, white, male, straight, healthy, able-bodied, um, are, th are those individuals being excluded from um, these kind of conversations and efforts? I think, yeah, definitely. Um, and the question isn't really, are they being excluded, but how are they being excluded? And is that exclusion productive or uh, destructive to what we're trying to accomplish, which is a more representative legal profession? And so um, it, it comes down to why they're feeling excluded, because there are pipeline programs, there are scholarships, there are all these great efforts and initiatives that all these panelists mentioned um, that by definition are going to exclude people like a white male arbitrator in this hypothetical. Um, but that white male arbitrator has to then all right, internalize that feeling of exclusion. Um, and for, for the non-white males, we have to say, okay, well, they're feeling excluded. We can't just discount that because um, those are real feelings. Um, but how do we, how, how do we um, incorporate that into, into our overall project? And for the white males, it's, it's really a critical uh, time to get a little bit of therapy, self-help, self-inquiry, self and ask yourself, why are you feeling excluded? And, and does that trigger you in some sort of way? Even, even for me, it did, um, you know, as a law student, seeing certain initiatives and wondering, well, um, you know, I don't look Latino. So uh, am I being um, dis like, am I being disadvantaged in some, some way? And we have to kind of recognize that it's not a zero sum game. Um, I, I want to shout out, uh, I don't think he's on this panel because he's not, he's, uh, he's more of a financial regulatory guy, but Andrew Lipton at Morgan Stanley really hit it home for me because he was a white male at Morgan Stanley and I was there as a 1L summer and he mentioned that he was uh, going to a leadership conference on um, improving women diversity, uh, female diversity in, in, at Morgan Stanley, and he was asked by someone there, uh, why are you here? You're a white male. Um, and he said, well, <laughs> I'm here because I have daughters, I have a wife, and this issue affects me too. Um, and so it's really, it comes down to, okay, if you're excluded from certain conversations, that doesn't mean you're excluded from the whole project. And so when white males, including Latinos, because we have to own up that, that, uh, that privilege, a lot of us, uh, Latinos and Hispanic people, we, we can't have it both ways. Uh, we get to play it some way, but we, we have a privilege. We can uh, choose to identify as Latino in some conversations and in other spaces, we can choose to identify as white. Not everyone has that advantage, but some of us do. And so, but even then we have that privilege and we feel excluded. We should try to get included in some sort of way because we have to kind of grapple with, if you're feeling excluded, um, where's that coming from? If it's coming from a negative place internally about, you know, fears of competition, insecurities, other things like that, work on that. That's probably an own internal issue that's not connected to the legal profession. But if it's coming from a valid place of, you know, feeling like there's no way to, to talk or you're self-excluding because you feel like, the, the minorities in your workplace uh, don't want you there. Um, it, it all comes from a place of vulnerability and having those conversations. I'll share a quick anecdote with me. When we were um, heading up our regional Latina Leadership Academy program, I spoke with my, uh, my women deputies and I said, look, here's the planning call, here's the agenda, here's some items that we could do, but I don't think I should be on this call because I'm, you, I want a safe space for you all to figure out what issues you need to, need to put in. And one of my deputies, Yasmin Tamor, uh, rightfully checked me and she said, Thanks, Jimmy, we, we know where your heart is, um, but white males have the networks. White males are the most powerful allies and we need you in some capacity. Um, so you come at it from a place of humility and if you're feeling excluded, vocalize that. But also, you know, once you do it, you know, once you vocalize it, you may come to learn uh, something. So for the white males in the room, which you know, on the panel, I think I'm the only white male here, but 
for the um, audience, I think, if it's any uh, indicative of the overall legal uh, profession, is mostly white males. Um, if you're feeling excluded, that's a valid feeling, but try to interrogate why you're feeling excluded and, and vocalize it. Find, find people, research it, and, and really try to um, buy into this project because it's so ultimately going to the right direction, which Reka said, it's, it's all going forward. So it'll be a lot smoother for everybody if you try to figure out where your place in it, uh, in it is. Great point. Ra Rachel, you want to make a comment? I saw you raise your hand. Yeah, Thank I, I was going to say really, really Jimmy. quickly to just further what Jimmy was say, saying, you know, I, I'm on an organization where there, um, you know, was a question of whether or not um, a white male could join one of our subcommittees. Absolutely. Um, you're not being excluded from the conversation. However, if you, what you want to participate in the conversation is opposition to the initiatives because you don't think we should be doing anything or because you have, quote, um, diversity fatigue, that's a different conversation. Um, and so that that's where that's probably the only place, if I'm being blunt, where I would say you're excluded. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I think I think that we should also just normalize having them as part of the table, even in the onset when we're looking to create these task force, um, because there are many allies in this room um, that are on this panel as well as um, in the room now to even be part of this program. So I think it's important to make sure right when you're starting to put these task force together, putting these initiatives, that you have those voices in the room um, to make sure that these initiatives actually come to fruition because they have their colleagues, they're going to be able to be the sponsors and the mentors um, for those that are going to be in the pipeline um, later down, later on down the line. You're right. Lauren, you just, got a question? Oh, I'm so oh. sorry. I'm just going to butt in super quick. Sorry, Lauren. Okay. Um, before it's 655 and people are really energized about the discussion, but they also want that CLE credit, that sweet, yes. sweet CLE credit. Yep. So the final CLE code word is create. Okay. That's code word number four. The final CLE code word is create for those of you who want that CLE credit. And just quickly, um, if you're looking for CLE credit, um, the fantastic Roseman White resent the link an hour ago, so it's at the top of your inbox. Just click on the link, put in the four words, click submit, and you're done. Great. All right. Thank I you. I wanted to mention something about allyship. Um, the you know traditionally women focused groups like the Equal Representation Arbitration Pledge, known as the Arbitration Pledge. That's um, an international nonprofit as well, focused on women. It's not exclusively focused on women. It's focused on women and diversity. And it was, um, it's broadened to include all different kinds of diversity. And we recently launched the US chapter of the Arbitration Pledge. And it is inclusive of many different stakeholders in the arbitration ADR process, including white men, including diverse men, including diverse women. It is also geographically diverse and co-chaired specifically to cover the entire USA um, coast to coast, as opposed to being centric to the East Coast or the West Coast. So I do think that organizations are trying to embrace allyship and working together and including um, all stakeholders who support diversity whether or not they themselves qualify as diverse. Great, thank you, Dana. We're gonna go over a little bit uh, for the audience and Lauren, I'm gonna to turn to you. You had a comment too, Lauren. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, just quickly, I just wanna note, you know, I, I talk about this a lot and I feel I'd be remiss to say that making a conscious effort to help one group, right, doesn't necessarily mean you're hurting another. Um, you know, to me, it seems like if you're trying to intentionally, for us, right, we're all trying to intentionally level the playing field and diversify the field and spread the work around instead of one group potentially getting an overwhelming amount of business with others considerably less so. And I think history and evidence shows that without this specific level of intention nothing's going to change. Um, and so, yes, there perhaps is a feeling of exclusion, but, you know, is it necessary? You know, is, is it perhaps part of the collateral damage to really accomplishing the overall goal? I yep. posit probably. Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Reka, you have a question for Judge Shenlin, I think. And yeah, we so we're, we're pivoting to the segment on um, action. So with the no notion, every person has a role to play, even one small act makes a difference. So Judge Shinlin, to you, how can experienced arbitrators or mediators or arbitrators and mediators, if you double hat, help our efforts? Oh, thanks for the question, Reka. It's my favorite question. 
you know, of course, I'm next to last, but I'm not last. Rodney, you've got one after me. <laughs> so this time I'm next to last. But um, I do love this topic because I feel that it's the most important of all. We all have to take personal responsibility to make change. And I have to start by telling you that for the many years that I was on the district court, a, a, a big special entry into the legal community is getting a clerkship. And I have to tell you that most clerkships went to white people full stop. I was committed in my own mind to saying, no matter what it takes, I'm going to find this year a black male. I'm gonna find next year a black female. I'm gonna find the year after an Asian person. I'm going to find, and I went on and on like that. And if all the judges had made that kind of effort, it would have made a real difference in the statistics. And of course the statistics were not good. The district court was better than the circuit court and the circuit court was better than the Supreme Court because those clerkships were so sought after and so hard to get. So I just wanna make that point that it, it takes an effort. It takes a personal commitment to make a difference. So now what do I do as an experienced arbitrator and mediator? I'm often a wing and the two wings get to pick a chair. When I'm in that position and I'm asked for five names, frankly, I give five diverse names, period full stop, because I say to myself, others will give a different kind of list. And so I'm gonna take that initiative to be sure that my lists are all diverse in the hope that one of those five will be selected. And I know others have made that kind of effort. There's a woman judge I know who only gives names of women, all kinds of women, but names of women, good for her. It makes sure that they're selected. I'll give you another one, a quick anecdote, and it kind of relates to the last question too about white males. <clears throat> Early on in my arbitration career, I was on a panel with two women and a male. The, uh, the entity that uh, picked us all said, Mr. So-and-so, you're gonna be the chair. He said, oh no, I'm not. This was a white male. He said, I would be uncomfortable being the chair with two women wings. One of those is gonna be the chair. Just tell me which one wants it. I raised my hand quickly. He said, great, you're the chair. And if he hadn't stepped up and done that, that wonderful white male judge, former judge, I wouldn't have had my first chair experience. And I, I really respected what he did. So I think that it's that kind of effort. It's relating to the last question from the white male. It's that kind of effort from experienced arbitrators who can make a difference that will move the needle. We keep talking about selection. Unless we all commit to making that effort, the selection statistics will not change. That's why this is my favorite subject. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna thank you, Judge Shenlow. That was that was great. Uh, can we can I just add one more uh, thing? You can to add that? one. Yep. Just one thing. Um, outside of the you know uh, the sponsorship aspect, I think that we also need to look at opportunities for co-mediation opportunities of where you can bring a diverse neutral in that room and um, get them that experience within the client, so people start to know who that um, that neutral is, so that next time they'll consider them uh, for another case on their own. So I think that's something else that we need to look at as well. Absolutely, Rodney, you're going to close us out. You got the last question, <laughs> you're Rodney. Close you out. You're going to close us out. <laughs> How far right. can how far can we push ADR users, uh, you know, Joanne, uh, Ann, uh, to uh, select diverse Absolutely. arbitrators? How, how far can you That's, push them? Well, clearly... Um, and, 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 uh, and house counsel, like too. Yes, clearly having more programs like this where we're exposing and we're having these conversations and we're exposing other um, ADR neutrals who are diverse in this community, having that conversation, number one. Number two, of course, education, right? Educating people about the ability to have these people and the importance they may, they may play in resolving issues that are coming to play. I think one of the other things that we could do is reaching out to the ADR mediation um, programs at the various law schools. I, I love the program that I was involved in at Cardozo with Layla Love and, and yep. having that kind of exposure and reaching out and see if you can get people from there. I know there was conversations about a fellowship that some of the programs that was talked about is offering and other programs for the young mediators and to get them exposed um, to that. And that puts them in that milieu of other people who may say, oh, I can use you as such as John just, just expressed as a co-mediator. And, and that again gives exposure. And I think the, the, the 
last thing, of course, is establishing relationship with different corporations, DEI programs, yeah. and letting them know that there are arbitrators uh, who are diverse um, to participate in whatever arbitrations that are happening. So there's four things that I, I see clearly that can be done to push the whole idea of selecting um, arbitrators of, from diverse backgrounds into um, the mix, so to right. speak. Right, Jeff, I'd you. like to add just one comment. I know you Please. said I know you said Rodney was closing it out, but I can't resist. <laughs> just, just one more comment. Um, you know, we we've done a study of women in the profession side, not the ADR side, but the legal, uh, the lawyers, and what we found was it had to come from in-house counsel. When yeah. in-house counsel insisted that their law firms put forth diverse people for trial teams, they did. And basically they said, you're not going to be paid. You're not going to be retained unless you are diverse. And of course, we heard that earlier, from Mr. Maroney. So I believe, again, to answer the question exactly as you posed it, what role can in-house and outside counsel play? I think the burden is very much on in-house counsel to say to their outside counsel, when you get those lists, we want you to come up with a diverse panel, period. And if yep. you don't, if you don't, there are a lot of other firms in town. Absolutely. Uh, Anne Lesser, you have a, your hand up. Well, yeah, I just wanted to have a really quick follow up to, to Judge Shin and, and, and also to Rodney. So I think that Judge Shin made a very important point. And I've attended, you know, many conferences like with MCCA or with NAMWOLF. And there are a lot of panels where they talk about encouraging like corporate counsel, encouraging the law firms that do work with them to use uh, diverse lit, um, litigators, et cetera, et cetera. But I think we need to educate corporate counsel. We need to educate them to understand it's not just about putting the diverse litigants into the mix, thinking about you, the issue that you're dealing with, the issue that's going to mediation and arbitration, and understanding that that it's that it's the whole like they have to look at the whole gestalt, so to speak, and understanding that it's important to have diverse arbitrators and mediators handle those issues as well. So you can't just stop saying, okay, yeah, 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 we've got litigators now. And that's really important for many aspects. Also, even because you're, you know, those people will move on and become arbitrators, we hope themselves or mediators, but also that they, ha you have to look at the entire picture. And I feel like with corporate counsel, it might just stop short at that point. And they haven't quite seen the picture all the way to the end. So that's my two cents. Great two cents. Thank you. And I think that's Genesis. Uh, are we, uh, Professor, are we uh, over? <laughs> I no, I think you're, I mean, we could be here all night. I don't, I, mean, you know, I, I, mean, I know this, this is a, it's such a, such an energizing discussion. And I mean, I could, you know, we, we talk about ceiling credit, but I feel like I should get college credit for this because I, I feel like I've learned so much today. Well, well for, Professor, remember when we did the planning call, it was a great conversation then. The planning call with these these these, these nine panelists was phenomenal. But yeah, yes. it, they were great. But so I, I turn it back to you uh, as the uh, the moderator of this whole program. Well, thank, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Jeff and Rake, and thank you to all of the, uh, the people in the roundtable discussion. And so... Um, I just want to offer a few takeaways because we've been together since about 4.30 and we have covered so much in a very short amount of time. And in lieu of the, you know, usual, uh, you know, little round tables that we have as small groups, it's going to offer some, some takeaways from today. So we talked about collecting and exploring data to understand the pipeline, like where the issues are and tracking real change and measuring progress by looking at the numbers, which firms and attorneys are prioritizing diversity and neutral selection. We also talked about acknowledging responsibility on all levels and developing resolutions and model language that make it easier and clear for firms and practitioners and clients to adopt policies and join us in this movement. Um, we also heard from the roundtable about a range of incredibly thoughtful programs and initiatives that provide both exposure and support, not just in recruitment, but also helping people thrive when they join a panel or organization. And then lastly, we can, you know, some of what I took out of this, this last really robust discussion is we can acknowledge that defining diversity is complicated while still prioritizing it, right? Both, both things are true at the same time. And also that allies and individuals make a real difference on a day-to-day -day level for a lot of people. So we have a ways to go. 
but great minds are looking at the layers of need and investing time and energy and resources into change. And that's great. And I can say on a very personal note, I remember coming to this event maybe four or five years ago when I was just joining this community and thinking about, oh my goodness, how, how are we even going to make any progress? There's so, there's so, there's so much to do. There's such a ways to go. And then now I'm a part of this. So that's one thing I'm a part of this now, but also all of these initiatives, a lot of these are new and it's really exciting that, that there's just been this explosion of activity. Um, so before we, before we close, I just want to thank the people who spoke today. So thank you, uh, Governor Patterson. Thank you to um, Dean um, Crowell, uh, Bill Johnston, Deborah Enix Ross, Tim Maroney, Jeff and Reka, and the dream team right there of, uh, of an expert roundtable. Yeah, Definitely a dream, dream team. team. Definitely yes. a dream team. I love them. You guys are great. And let, let me also say, too, since, since I have most people here, that um, New York Law School ADR program, we offer a lot of thought-provoking events like this throughout the school year. And you'll hear from it. You'll get an email from us. So hopefully you can join us at, at some of these events in the future. And we just thank you for being with us today. I know we're over, but thank you for being a part of this energizing program. Thank you, uh, Professor. Thank you. You're, you're thank amazing. You so thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have Bye -bye. a great night. Have a good night. Thank you.